So yeah, the double attack is really just one of the most important tactics because you find it in all areas of the game and because any piece can commit a double attack. And generally in chess, you always want to be doing two things with every move, if not more, if possible. Like you can be very generous with thinking about doing two things with every move, right? Like when you play e4, you're developing your bishop and you're developing your queen, right? So there's a sense in which every move in chess, you're doing multiple purses, purposes usually. But I'm just gonna show you some of the double attacks that occur in the opening and then we'll go to some other ones. Uh, the first one, which I've seen the most strong players probably fall into, is against the Sicilian defense. Um, so what's the most popular move in this position? Bishop What's that? D4. D4 is the most popular move. What other moves are popular in this position? C3. C3 is, uh, C3 is somewhat popular, yeah. Any other? Bishop B5. Bishop B5 check, excellent. That's a, a good move as well. So bishop b5 check, c3, d4, anything else? b5. b4 you mean? b4, b4 is, occurs sometimes, it's a little rare. Um, there's also bishop c4, which sometimes people play. You can also play knight c3. So all kind of normal ways to play against a Sicilian, but by far the most popular is to play d4. Um, why, do, why is d4 such a popular move? Yeah, this is just this is a, just a, a nice way to continue developing and try to get a really quick development, especially considering the fact that Black's first couple moves didn't promote one of the main goals in chess openings, which is to do what? Develop pieces. To, and to develop pieces in castle, right? So White's going to be really aggressive, hoping that to take advantage of that. Uh, instead, in the game that we're going to look at, White played c3. And now, after knight to f6, you see a very frequent mistake here. White plays bishop to e2. What do we think of that move? Drops the pawn. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens if black plays knight takes pawn? Exactly, queen to a4 check. So this is a pretty common example of double attack in the opening. And I've seen a lot of people play that. So instead, what would you play here as black? So the double attack knight takes e4, allowing queen to a4, and the, the, it's a check and you can't stop the fact that I'm going to also capture your knight. Why hasn't black played knight c6? Well, yeah, the right move in this position is for black to play knight c6. No, but why haven't they played it already? Oh, you mean to play it originally? Well, sometimes people just, sometimes people play knight f6 to attack the pawn first. And because when you play knight c6, you know, they could also transpose into bishop b5 stuff. So a lot of times they, they start with knight f6, and then after, do you see what I mean? Like if knight f6, bishop e2, if you now play knight c6, you'd be losing a move if you played bishop b5. Yeah. So it's just a little bit of a, a move order thing. So now, what if white, if white plays d4? Can black capture the pawn? What happens now if black captures the pawn? Somebody, somebody, um, not here, raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just to, I wanted to make a comment about this position. It's funny because Roman actually gave this puzzle a lot of perplexity. Oh, really? Funny. Yeah. Was he talking about double attacks too? I, I think he was like, well, somebody asked for it, I think. Yeah, like, oh, it was like a game, so the game yeah, analysis, yeah, right. Like, you were like, the one who sent me a game, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. So what can white do now? Double attacks are constantly popping up in chess in all phases of the game. Exactly. It's just you just have to see one move further, right? You start with d5, attacking the knight, and then when the knight moves, wherever it moves. <coughs> Now you can play queen to a4 check. So the pawn on e4 is still taboo. That, that's one uh, big example of double attack in the opening. Um, another example that you sometimes see, especially in beginner's games, is stuff where 
say they play like this. Now, let's evaluate, how would you try to go for a double attack in this position? Okay, so you might play d4 hitting this bishop, right? Now, say uh, black were to put the bishop back here. Now, what's the idea? What can white play here? Somebody, uh, somebody else? How can, how can white commit a fork here? Commit a fork? I don't know if that makes any sense. Like commit a crime. <laughs> Sounds good, though. Execute a fork. It's probably better. Yes? So d5, yeah, and, and, that's, and that's just good for white, right? Because we're going to win either the knight or the bishop for a pawn. So instead, I mean, li life is not usually so simple. That's why I showed this example. Like sometimes even if you analyze and you say, yes, I'm going to win a piece because I'm going to play d4 and then d5, if your opponent plays a little bit better than that, it won't end up that great. So what would black play instead here? Uh, yeah, somebody else. So how play better for black. Sal, what do you think? You don't want to ask me because I just like to change exchange pieces. Okay, that's fine. So I, I take the pawn. You take the pawn to start, that's fine. And then after I take back? It's totally fine to take first. Take that and um, like the rest of the Momentarily, just for one move, but the threat is renewed. If you were to play bishop back, I would play d5 again and have a double attack anyway. Hmm? Take with the knight. Um, if you take with the knight, I've got too many pieces on it, right? I take back and I'm going to be ahead material. Now this, this uses another tactic. Usually tactics in chess are not cut and dried. There's usually some combination of tactics, like it's either a double attack plus a pin or a double attack plus removal of the guard. Usually there's like different things going on. In this case, it's double attack. And what's the other principle at play here that black can try to use to get out of it? Zwischenzug. Anybody know what Zwischenzug means in English? That's a German word for probably the most important tactic at the uh, grandmaster or master level. Um, the most important tactic at the grandmaster or master level, I would say, is Zwischenzug, which is known as in-between in move, right? In-between move is a move that you try to stick in the variation so that your opponent can't do exactly what they wanted to do. And you, usually it's a move where you're getting attacked, but you create a check or an attack on a piece that's more important so that you can gain some time. Yeah? Avoid the double attack, yeah. Uh huh. Exactly, bishop takes bishop. And now when bishop takes bishop, you see that you're going to get out of it because if once I recapture, the bishop can move, and now everything is fine for black. I have a question. Uh huh. Okay, uh, going back to the position after, um, if, if, if they exchange pawns first, I, I, I was wondering if it still works because. Uh, what if white plays bishop takes bishop? No, no, instead of capturing back the pawn, we play bishop takes bishop first. Mm -hmm. And then after they take, yeah, okay, let's take. And then we can play queen b3. Right, okay, well, queen b3 attacks b7 and e6 at the same time, which is kind of a double attack, but at least it, at least it doesn't lose a piece. Now, if you had to choose, well, First of all, this is a good, a good place to point out the concept of double defense, right? We talk about double attack, attacking two things at once. But we can also double defend, defend two things at once. How can you defend both the pawn on b7 and e6 at once here? Yeah? Exactly, queen c8. So that's why I like to think about double attack more broadly, because a lot of times in chess, it's not just about attacking two things at once. It's just about doing two things at once, period. So let's take a look at some examples in the middle game of double attack. Um, double attack can really occur in any opening. All right, well, this is a, a cool example of a double attack. I feel like if you know the answer to this, but you shouldn't say it. Yeah, if you know it right away. Well, it's a little easier based on, um, based on the theme of the last end. This is just a, a very cool position, which um, is a good one to jot down in your notebook to show to friends. Yeah. 
So white to move and win. It looks like it's a totally dead draw because we got one rook versus another rook, right? Usually that's a draw unless somebody hangs a rook, right? So what can white play here? We've got two people who've got it. Let's just see if a couple more people can get it before we move on. Ben Simon here in the front row is not totally sure. You've seen this one before? <laughs> You've heard this one before? Everybody else looks genuinely puzzled. We got another one? Okay. Next person who gets it right, I will actually call on. Just can't wait for everyone to get it. <laughs> and so I think we've got like, uh, you've got like four people or something who've solved it. Yeah, anyone else? You got an answer over there? Huh? This one is one where you got to be sure you know all the rules of chess. Oh. <laughs> was that too big of a hit? It was a pretty big hit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, in, in the back of the glasses, yeah? I remember it. Now, oh, you remember it, okay. Sal? So? Are you saying that they haven't castled yet? Well, so, you, what, yeah, well, they haven't castled yet, yeah. They have? They haven't. Well, then you obviously can. Yes. So you, you do what? You queen, give me the move. Well, it's just king to c1. Well, yeah, we call it queenside castles, right? But that was the great question. Triple O, yes. Queenside castles. And this is a, uh, exactly that too. This is a very pretty double attack. A cool position. It would be really fun if you could get that in a real game, wouldn't it? I would love that. <laughs> so you can even double attack while castling. Let's look at another one. So this is white to move. What would you think? Of, what would be your first candidate move if you were white here? The first thing that you would play if you were white. Well, that's one thing you might consider playing. But like, if you were, if you looked at the board the first second, what what move would you probably look at? Knight g6, hoping to see if I could have discovered attack. Well, you might look at knight g6, but then you'd realize queen takes g6 yep, check. You might look at knight takes rock. What happens if knight takes rock? Yes. What's the best way to play here? See if somebody can do this. There's actually a maiden about five here for black. Well, you could play queen takes rook, but you've got before you before you play that move, you want to make sure it's the very best because worst case scenario is white now. I could just take your knight, and now you know the situation's not so bad for me, right? I'm up a pawn, and everything seems fine. So, especially in positions where you have multiple forcing moves, I know Ronan talked a lot about forcing moves, and it's such an important concept. You don't want to just go for the first one you see, like, oh, I can take a rook, great. You want to make sure you say, well, what about that check? What about that check? What about that capture? Right, that's a, a, a nice little chess expression. Find a good move, look for a better one. Um, and I, I would definitely agree with that, especially in a case where there's multiple checks and captures. What I tell my students is anytime there's a check, a capture, or a checkmate threat, at least take a look at it. It doesn't mean you have to play it, but at least look at it. So anyone want to try to checkmate in five moves here? Yes. All right, let's do it in our heads to start. All right, so. Queen to g6, well, I'm going to, if I play king h1, somebody else tell me why there's maiden one. Queen to g7, um, Exactly. So instead, I'll play king to f1. That gives me a better chance of survival. Because now, if you played queen g2 check, at least I could play king e1. So after king f1, what's the best move? Queen to c4 check. 
Well, you're actually on g6 now, right? So once you play queen g6 check, queen b1 check, good. And then um, let's say I play king to a queen to e1. OK, good. And then I play king to g1. Excellent. So the cool thing about that is that you're just basically going back to the original position, except now the queen's on e1 blocking the escape square. So it's a forced mate, right? The idea is queen g6 check, king f1, queen b1, queen e1, queen d3 check, king g g1. And we've basically gone in a whole circle. But it's been a worthwhile circle because now it's actually checkmate on g2. So that leads us back to the original position. Actually, taking that rook off on c8 would be a horrendous blunder. Instead, white needs to play what? I think a couple people mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, but let's see if a couple more people can get it. So um, other forcing moves. Knight g6 check didn't work out because of queen takes g6, which actually would be mating. Knight takes c8 allows black to mate, but white still has one very good move here. <coughs> Sal? Oh, so, um, knight g6 was mentioned, um, but if knight g6 check, then the uh, queen can capture on g6 with check, and then we're going to also come into g2, and things will look very ugly indeed. So, what were you going to say? Yeah, you know, you're looking at me like you know the answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would take the knight. Yes, take the knight, right? So you're just taking the knight, and this is a very common motif where you sacrifice the queen, and then you get to play knight to g6 check. And now you're left up a uh, piece in the end of the variation, and we'll see a more complicated example of that in a second. So here, how about this position? This is white to move. This is from a game where Judith Polgar, the uh, strongest woman in uh, chess history, is playing against Vichy Anand, who is best known for being what? Yes, the current world champion. So it's good to know who the current world champion is. Now, a lot of people don't know who Anand is. As like a, a lot of average people in India, Anand's extremely famous. But right now, I'd say in the Western press, there is a player who's way more well known than Anand even though he's not the current world champion. Who am I talking about? Carlson. Yeah, Magnus Carlsen is the world number one rated player. So <laughs> there's that kind of confusion in the chess world where the world champion is not always the number one rated. But obviously, that happens in lots of other sports too. So it's not really that strange. So this one's white to move. Take your time on this for just a minute. Because even if you already got it, I want to give people another, other people a, a quick chance.
So raise your hand if you got it. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good. What, what do you think it is? Yeah. Work to H7, and then after King takes H7. Okay, knight takes bishop. And now, what do you think uh, black's best move is in this position? This is a very good try. Because if rook takes f6 now, queen takes d7 check and, black's win and white's winning, right? But what, 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 uh, what good move does uh, black have here? Uh, well, actually... Huh, maybe your move, mm. no, no, I, I think black has a defense here, yeah. One of, one of the defenses I thought he had doesn't quite work, though. Yeah, so king h6, and now if knight takes queen, black can play what? Yeah, and then black's actually doing well. He's up in exchange, right? So the, uh, the problem there, the problem with your calculation there was just that it's, it's not t exactly, it's not totally forcing, right? So you just need to visualize the position. That's, that was a really good try though, and I think it's a common example of what's wrong with certain calculations, that especially when you're in the business of sacrificing, you kind of have to double, triple check. Whereas when you're playing a regular position and you're just like, say, moving a rook to an open file, you don't really have to double or triple check your analysis. It's just like, oh, this is probably a good move, right? Whereas anytime you sacrifice something, you really got to make absolutely sure that you don't leave any, any stone unturned um, in your opponent's defenses. So the key thing here is move order. Move order is a very important concept in calculation and tactics. Um, a lot of times when you have an idea that almost works, if you tweak the move order, the order of moves that you play, it will suddenly work. Um, what did you have in mind? You said you had the, the answer to the position? Uh, so you want to play e5 here. What do you think uh, black would do here? Um, he the well, if he takes the knight, yeah, I mean, that actually looks pretty good, too. Okay. Yeah. That looks good as well. Yeah. Because this, this doesn't really lead to anything, right? Yeah. Okay. And then it's not mate. Yeah? So I can like I can still play King H seven or something and I have the extra rock, right? I was also thinking that you could you can maybe just take the rook off immediately as well. That kind of leads to the same thing. Yeah. So E five doesn't quite work here. So it's usually harder to find tactics when there's a number of ideas, yeah? Yeah. Similar concept as before, yeah. So somehow all the move orders are being tried, yeah. but you really need to get the perfect one, yeah? Uh, how about queen takes bishop check? Exactly. So queen takes, and that's what you thought too? I, I believe you, don't worry. I could tell by your like, <sighs> queen takes bishop, and then after rook takes, now what? And now rook to h7, exactly. So see how we used exactly the same idea that he came up with, but by switching the move order, it became, went from losing exchange to actually winning a full piece. So a very nice uh, position. And one of the things about double attacks is you can do it with any piece, right? A pawn can double attack, a king can double attack, a bishop, every piece can do a double attack. What's the most common piece to give a double attack, though, would you think? What do we see the most often, yeah? Yeah, we probably see the knights more often than any other piece, especially in beginner's games, because they sometimes leave like the c7 or the f7 pawn, pawn hanging. Um, but what do you think we see the least of? Probably not, because you get things like d4. Probably the king. What would you do here? No, this can't be white to move because then white would play rook takes king 
X Clan. <laughs> no, it's black. So, what do you guys? What do you guys think of the position for black? Is the question. All right, guys. Think. Give me some uh, analysis to think about it a little longer, and then give me some analysis. <laughs> The, okay, that's good, but let's look at the normal moves first, just because they also involve some double attacks, believe it or not. Um, so what would be the first thing that you would think about playing here as black? What might you consider playing? You might consider moving the king, right? Because you're in check. So if the king moves to e8, what would white do? Okay, the, you, if you, the king goes to e8, the white rook goes to e7 check. And then what do you think black would do then? And what's that called? That's called a discovery check. Exactly. So if the king goes to e8, rook e7 check, king f8, and now you can play, for instance, rook to a7 with a discovered attack, also known as a boo attack, and then you get to capture the queen on a5 next move, right? Right, exactly. So if he goes to d8 after rook e7 check, then we have a double attack with what? Bishop c7 check, right? And then even though he gets to capture our rook, we play bishop takes queen, and the position is uh, pretty equal. Um, yeah, just totally symmetrical. Some play, some play, somebody's going to have to do something really stupid to lose, I think. <laughs> Yeah, some people are worse at end games than others. So in, instead, what happens if uh, black plays after, instead he decides he doesn't want to play king e8 and he plays king d8? What happens on king d8? So somebody want to show me the checkmate in two? What do you think? You got it? Yeah. No, I'm asking uh, in front of you. See? Yeah. yeah. Bishop b7. Bishop b7, and then just after king e8. Um, well, actually, rook c8 is not the right move. Uh, no, no, uh, sorry. Rook knight. Yeah. Because the rook is that the rook on c7 is actually performing the useful function of protecting the bishop on e7, right? So instead, knight to d6 is checkmate, though, right? So this is mate. So what should black do instead? In this position, and black to move and actually win, surprisingly. Despite all that, black has a win here. See if one or two or more people can get it, and then we'll. Anyone else got an idea? Yeah? You're nodding. Queen takes work and then uh, and then what's the deal? Double attack. I mean, yeah, double attack. Mm -hmm. well, what would white get recapture with? The bishop, uh, right. The white would recapture with the bishop and then black plays. 
Exactly. Now king c6 attacking the bishop and the knight. And that's actually exactly the double attack that you had prepared, right? So you must have seen this really quickly. When I asked him to uh, construct a double attack, this was the exact one that he put on the board. Yeah. So the, uh, the knight has to move, and then the bishop falls. So as you can see, I mean, these double attacks, they can be very simple. Like, I wasn't sure that for the class before this, I was going to show them some, uh, some really simple double attacks. As it turned out, some of the, some of the people didn't know the, moves of the rules of, the, of chess, so I wasn't sure about that. But you know, they can be absolutely simple, right? Like, let's go through the really simple ones very quickly. Bishop c3 check, right? You can call them out if you want. So, to a double attack with a pawn, right? With f4 check. So it can be very complicated, like the example that we looked at with queen takes bishop followed by rook to h7 check to extremely simple. And that's the cool thing about this tactic. It's really true with almost all tactics. Here's another one that's a little bit more complicated. So what would you do here as white? And take your time. I'm oh, sorry. Actually, I, th I think the position set up wrong. Yeah, yeah there's, uh, there's a piece missing. Let me just, I, I'll fix that. No wonder it's so tough. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> the ghost. Let, let's see if it's somebody. Let's see, let's see what everybody thinks. Because you've got a couple of tempting ideas in this position. of tempting ideas. Let's see what different ideas we have. What, do you, what would you think about playing here? Still, 96 was the first thing I had. The 96 was the first move that occurred to you? <laughs> Forking the rooks, and if he takes with the pawn, then even better, which he won't do. Any other ideas, or is everybody basically set on that move? What about, just out of curiosity, I actually, I, I agree, knight e6 is, is the best move. And it looks like white's doing really well now because you're just going to pick up an exchange because they can't recapture because then there's another double attack, right? But why is uh, bishop e6 not a good move? This is something that a lot of a lot of players, you know, sometimes get confused about. Like, why wouldn't Bishop E6 be equally good? With the idea that if they take, you can take back with a knight and fork the two rooks. What's the difference, Sal? Well, the knight isn't putting pressure on the queen. Well, okay, so there's not a variation where you actually end up winning the queen. <laughs> sure. You're paying two pieces for a rook to do that. Exactly right. So if if they capture here and you t and you take back with a knight, even though you're forking the two rooks. Um, black could, for instance, move. Well, actually, the position. Black could make rook to f7, and then after knight takes d8, queen takes d8. It's still probably good for white, honestly, because of all these pawns. But it's it's not um, completely kaput like the other position. Yeah. What was your question? Why not pawn though? Um. After after what? So after capturing, you know, after bishop e6, and then. Yeah, that's a good question. So bishop e6. After pawn e6, 
Just pawn takes. Um, well, I have to play queen c8 basically, right? It's true. Yeah, that does look pretty good too because if you play e7 immediately, I could check. But one thing I could do here is I could start with rook takes and then after rook takes, then I could play queen here. Still looks pretty dangerous after e7 now. Same thing. It's also like it looks totally devastating anyway. Although I guess, no. Maybe I could play knight takes knight here, though. Yeah, I, I forgot about that move. That looks pretty. It's true, but it's not, it's not as clear. You've given up all your good pawns. And I, I, and I end up with the e4 pawn, right? Like, after pawn takes. Oh, excuse me. In this position, like this is not this is not nearly as good as the other lines that we were looking at, right? Because black has just like weathered the storm, and even if white is up in exchange, black has this pawn on e4, and it's just not as clear as any of the other things. Yeah. Mm hmm. Um. In what? In which line? Which one? So queen here now here. Well, if you play queen b3 here, my first instinct is going to be, let's see. Interference. Well, interfering with the knight here is probably, probably going to be the best, yeah. Yeah, and this is uh, not totally clear, all right? All right. So, good job, though. Knight e6 is, is way easier and, you know, doesn't allow for all that messiness. So let's show one more. All right, so here we go. This one is a black to move position. It's probably the hardest one I've shown you. So take your time. So black to move and win, or get a really good position, rather. This is a tactic that definitely uses a lot of different themes, not just double attack. Usually the more complicated, the more likely it is to be a combination of themes, not just one. Rex. How about queen a5? Well, queen a5 is attacking the, uh, the pawn on a2. What do you think the best defense would be there for white? Um, there is one only, I guess there's really only one good defense. Oh, maybe G3. Yeah, B3 is a pretty good defense though, because then once you play, once you play Queen A5, once I play B3, uh, it's not clear how you follow up on that. Everything seems to be reasonably well defended. And you, I know like you would probably like to play Queen A3 and then like get a Rook to A5, but that's very difficult to do. Actually, it's kind of funny. Um, if you play queen a5 and I play b3 and you play queen a3, then, like, say I just play some random move like h5 and you play a5, what can white do? Uh huh. Yeah, bishop b2 traps the queen. <laughs> it's a pretty funny line. I'm just showing you a, a self made of the queen. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you've got the right idea that there is like a temporary looseness on the A2 pawn, right? We talk about loose pieces, but it's also important. There's an expression, loose pieces drop off, which refers to the fact that when you have a rook that's on a square where the rook's not defended, it's, it's liable to things like double attacks, discovered attacks. 
but there's also loose points, right? A2 is, for the moment, it's defended by the king, but it's still a little bit tender. And so that's why a move like queen a5 should definitely always be on your list of candidate moves. But this is a, another case where move order might come into play. So move order is really key here. All right, yeah, you got an idea? Okay, so bishop takes a2 check. Let, let, I think you probably have the idea because you seem to be getting a lot of questions, right? So let's see if somebody else mm -hmm. can jump off from this idea and see what you had in mind. So um, what's your name again? Julian. So Julian mentions bishop takes a2 check, sacrificing the bishop. Now, what do you think the idea is after king takes a2? Somebody else try to follow up on Julian's attack? Queen a5, maybe. So queen a5 check. Is that, that might be his idea, but then, um, was that what you were going to play? Yeah. That was what you were going to play. Okay, um, if you play queen to a5 check, uh, there's a couple of moves there for, what were you going to do after king to b1? Uh, let let some, somebody else try to figure it out. So what are you going to do after king to b1? So you want to play bishop to a2 check, King takes a2, and then queen to a5 check, and then king to b1. Pawn to b3, okay, and what does that do? Exactly. So, and, and what else is it threatening? Like, what if we just play pawn takes pawn? Then I think you play rook to c1 check, king takes, king down a. Not exactly, because if bishop takes e2, king a2, queen a5 check, king b1, b3, if we take on b3 and you play rook c1 check, we can still recapture with the rook, right? So I think Julian had something else in mind. Oh, that's okay. Julian, what did you have in mind? I want to take the rook. Exactly. So that's where the double attack comes in. So he's, he's not trying to mate you at any, at any point. Now he's just ca capturing that loose rook on d2, from the concept of loose pieces drop off, right? So again, bishop takes a2, check, king a2, queen a5, check. And now, what would you have done if I played king to b3 instead? Anybody else want to answer that? It looks pretty dangerous, right? <laughs> you mean queen to d5 check? Uh, yes. Okay, and now if I play bishop c4, you just play queen takes c4. If you play c4, what happens? Um. Now this one's important. You've got to see this one. Yes, you got to take on Passan. Excellent. Take on, on Passan, and now, again, it's kind of a double attack. Um, you're, you're checking the king, and you're attacking this rook, right? So that's totally winning. So really, the only thing that you would be worried about here would be king takes pawn. <laughs> I know, I, <laughs> that would be the only one that would require much calculation, rather. So rook to b8 check. And now, what would you do if your opponent played king to a3? Queen to a5, you mean? Queen i5, right. And what would you do if your opponent played king to a4 then? Well, because you can't play, if you play queen b5, yeah. 
So instead, they have to play king b1. And then this move is hard to see from the initial position. But now that we got it here, it becomes a lot more obvious, right? That when you play b3, it's creating a double attack with the, uh, the queen heading to this square and the rook on d2 hanging. So, and this was from a grandmaster game. So like, it's, it's very interesting how the dou double attacks can be both beginner fodder, where people are just hanging forks, but they can also be used in very high level games when it becomes more complicated. And it's really like that with every tactic in chess, from skewer to fork to in between moves. So um, you just got to keep studying those tactics, even if you reach a pretty high level. I know players who are 2,600 who, you know, before tournaments, they'll train with the tactics trainers. Mm -hmm.